Hi, this is Steve Rendell for FAIR TV. Here's some of the things we noticed in the news this week. In the wake of the horrific massacre in Newtown, Connecticut, we are hearing some serious discussions of gun control. But as the debate unfolds, you're bound to hear some claim that there's a constitutional hurdle to such regulations in the form of the Second Amendment. Efforts to limit gun ownership may be complicated, Lester, by the fact that there was a recent Supreme Court ruling that said that the Second Amendment guarantees individuals' rights to have guns at home for self-defense. You know. Well, you, you do have this problem called there the Constitution. Is. Yeah. There is a Second but look, Amendment. The Wait, second let me, let me amendment, finish my right? thought. Okay. This is not entirely false. The Supreme Court's 2008 Heller decision gave a boost to those arguing that the Second Amendment is about an individual right. But a little more Second Amendment history is in order. That ruling was the first time the Supreme Court had interpreted the Second Amendment that way. And it came after several decades of legal and political advocacy that tried to reframe the Second Amendment and upend what had been the legal consensus. A sure sign of the success of the gun lobby's efforts is the fact that this history is often erased from the discussion of guns and the Constitution. What's not to love about fracking could have been the headline of Planet Money host Adam Davidson's piece in the December 16th New York Times Magazine. Citing an energy analyst, Davidson argues that fracking could result in millions of new jobs, hike our GDP by 3%, and add trillions in additional tax revenues. It will be a gift from the heavens for the steel industry. Davidson touches lightly on fracking's critics. Fracking, of course, is not universally embraced, as he puts it. And with all those new jobs and profits, Davidson asks, will environmental and health concerns have any chance against that juggernaut? Since those concerns hardly factored in his piece, he obviously doesn't care much about them. And for a report that focuses on the intense new investments in a fossil fuel technology, there's not a word about climate change, despite the fact that the methane that fracking can release from the earth is a super potent global warming gas. No, Davidson advises that it's time for anti-fracking environmentalists to start thinking like an economist. In reality, actual economists like Helene Jorgensen have a different message. As her report for Food and Water Watch explains, there are serious questions about whether fracking has resulted in an economic boom. She also says that the job creation record is exaggerated and that the costs such as lower property values and water and air pollution, can be substantial. Stories about Syria's WMDs sound an awful lot like stories about Iraq's WMDs 10 years ago. On December 19th, Washington Post columnist David Ignatius took these similarities even further. Syria has mobile chemical weapons labs. Citing a Syrian defector, Ignatius says the Assad government made several mobile mixers inside what looked like normal refrigerator trucks. Ignatius doesn't ignore the striking similarity to Iraq when a defector told the United States that Saddam Hussein had mobile bioweapons labs. The Post columnist mentions this, but then argues that this time it's different. Quote, seeking corroboration for the Syrian report, I checked it with knowledgeable independent sources. Close quote. Ignatius also reports that the chemical arsenal could be headed to Lebanon for use by the militant group Hezbollah. How solid is this story? Ignatius is getting it from a Syrian source aligned with the opposition, whom he spoke to by phone, who told him what he'd heard from the defector. And how do we know the chemicals are en route to Hezbollah? Someone saw a truck heading on a road in the direction of Lebanon. It's worth remembering that Iraq's mobile labs were actually found. They weren't for making weapons, though. They were for hydrogen for weather balloons. And it's also worth remembering that weeks after the Iraq invasion, Ignatius himself wrote, I don't much care if the U.S. reports about weapons of mass destruction prove to be imaginary. Toppling Hussein's regime was still right. So perhaps Ignatius' work should be taken less than seriously, since he's on the record saying he didn't really care about accuracy when it came to the war in Iraq. I'm Steve Rendell. Thanks for watching FAIR TV.